It's, um, welcome back, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Anne Hoganson, and her topic, which is spontaneous public prayer. Now, how many of us have been at meetings where someone said, now, would someone kindly lead a prayer? And all of a sudden, there's dead silence. And it's very, very uncomfortable silence sometimes. Well, Anne is looking at the reasons behind that pause, why that silence especially in her own context, which is the United Church of Canada. And she's also looking at some strategies for encouraging people to be more comfortable with spontaneous public prayer. So with that, I'll hand it over to Anne. So as we turn our hearts to prayer, would someone like to open us in prayer? Anyone? I'm serious. <laughs> Go on. God of all, thank you for your presence amongst us. Thanks for the brains we have to engage in. Be with Anne as she delivers her message and speaks to us through her words. Be with Anne as she delivers her presentation on prayer and we all deliver prayer from life. Amen. Thank you. So in 2002, at the ripe old age of 38, I started attending church. I fell in love, head over heels with God, with Jesus, with being on a spiritual journey, with being in a community of like-hearted people. And then one day, my minister asked me, would you do prayers of the people next Sunday? Yikes, I thought. I'd never prayed in public. I'd never written a prayer. The thought of writing a prayer that, that spoke to anyone other than me was extremely daunting. But I did write that prayer, and I opened my heart to the Spirit, and I offered my words to the congregation, and it was amazing. And I had never felt anything like it. But extemporaneous prayer? Pray what? No way! Forget it. I wasn't going to do that. I didn't know the language, and even if I did, I had no idea what to say. And I wasn't alone. I encountered a lot of people in my church and, uh, and since then who are extremely reluctant to pray without preparation. One of my participants, Regina, described an encounter with a woman who hadn't been to church for a long while. Regina said, I made sure to go say hello and give her a big hug and I invited her back another time and that is easy. But if she'd said, come and pray in the office with me, I would have thought, oh my heavens, what do I do now? Everywhere I go, as Joan mentioned, I notice that when the question is asked, would someone like to pray, there's this pause, this strange and weird to me pause. And it's a different kind of pause than, say, when a meeting, in a meeting, if an issue is raised and everybody takes a quick look around to see if somebody's waiting to speak because they don't want to cut somebody off before we jump in with our opinion. It's not that kind of a pause. And yet, I've had conversations, and many of them, that suggest that extemporaneous prayer opens people up to the movement of the Spirit in a unique way. So what is stopping us? If we believe ourselves to be children of an unconditionally loving God, if we believe ourselves to be in loving, inclusive, um, accepting communities of faith, if prayer is at the heart of our faith, why is there such a tightness around praying out loud together? So I decided to research this phenomenon. I found a lot of resources around prayer in other faith traditions, many of which focused on private prayer lives and spiritual practices and meditation, or on how to develop and write formal prayers, such as prayers of the people or prayers of confession, but not so much on a free-flowing, extemporaneous kind of a prayer, the kind that often causes fear and trembling in the people sitting in the pews. Now, by extemporaneous, I mean set on the spot, without advanced preparation, a spontaneous pouring out of prayer. And by public, I'm not talking about uh, praying in the public square. I'm talking about praying in public as opposed to keeping it in private, 
um, praying with our faith communities. In the book of Acts, we're told that the first converts devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. The Apostle Paul called people to pray ceaselessly. James told people to pray always, pray for each other, for healing. Communal prayer has long been, from the beginning, a part of our Christian tradition. In his article, uh, Whether Prayer Should Be Vocal, Thomas Aquinas argues that prayer is twofold, common and individual. Common prayer for the knowledge of all was to be said by the minister of the church in a loud voice. (laughs) Aquinas also offers, though, three reasons why individual prayer ought to be vocal. First, in order to excite interior devotion, he quotes Augustine as saying that by means of word and other signs, we arouse ourselves more effectively to an increase of holy desires. Second, praying in order to serve God, not only with the mind, but with the body. And third, Aquinas argues that speaking our prayers is a way of expressing the overflowing of joy in our heart. Now, I would add another dimension of prayer to that, and it's one that flows between Aquinas' um, vision of a common prayer spoken by the minister and an individual prayer. I would say that there is another kind of common prayer that is not for knowledge, but for unity. A shared vocal prayer that permeates the membrane between individual and community, that opens a space where we can enter into conversation with God together. Jürgen Moltmann describes God as love being experienced in the community through mutual acceptance and participation. The deeper the participation in the life of the other, the more united people will become. And Moltmann's description of praying to God applies beautifully to the experience of praying together in community. The prayer of the friend, he says, is a conversation in the freedom of love that shares and allows the other to share. So for my research project, I used a phenomenological approach which meant that I had to suspend my own assumption in order to allow the experiences of the participants to to shape the themes. The process I followed was one outlined by John Cresswell where I identified a phenomenon, the experience of extemporaneous uh, public prayer, and I had to set my own experience aside as much as possible in order to focus on the experience of the participants. So I didn't go into it assuming that everybody was going to tell me that they had a fear and trepidation around extemporaneous public prayer. I collected data by interviewing people who have experienced this phenomenon. And then I analyzed the data by pulling out significant statements and organizing those into themes and then looking at what was experienced and how it was experienced, and then trying to combine that what and the how in order to convey some essence of the experience. My primary method of data collection was through personal interviews with six participants. Now this small sampling is in keeping with uh, uh, the characteristics and expectations of a qualitative research, which seeks a complex and detailed understanding of issues that are difficult to capture through statistical methods. So I solicited uh, six participants through the ministry personnel of three different United Church pastoral churches, all in Nova Scotia. And the participant mix included five women, one man, and they were three, there were three lay members. There was one candidate for ministry who's not an AST student. Uh, one retired clergy and one active clergy. Their ages ranged from mid-30s to probably in their 60s or 70s. One participant chose her own code name. Otherwise, I used an online random name generator. So we have Gwen, Regina, Hugo, Iris, Loretta, and Alexandra. Four of these are lifelong members of the United Church. Two were raised in other traditions and came to the United Church in their adulthood. During my interviews and research, several themes emerged around those experiences, and I will turn to those now. The first one that emerged in every single interview 
was that when it comes to praying aloud, there is a huge concern around what will people think. And it's interesting that that same theme came up in Rachel's presentation and in Rob's presentation around gossip and preaching. It's a big theme in our church. Now, in the United Church, there's a denominational aspect to this concern that came out actually in four of the interviews. Hugo described a common United Church reaction to the evangelical tradition. We're like, whoa, you guys, pray willy-nilly, and that's weird, and we don't want that, because we might be seen as we're charismatic or evangelical. (laughs) And this aversion to being seen as charismatic or evangelical brings a real restraint and constraint, and it keeps people from finding their own authentic prayer voice. Regina's experience of extemporaneous prayer with family members in the Baptist tradition left this impression on her. Some would just drone on and on, and the longer they went on, the more skeptical I got. I wondered if they did it just for show. I like to think they were sincere, but I'm not sure. There's always that kind of doubt that you don't want someone thinking that of you. Now, the concern over uh, what people think of you has another dimension as well. Iris told me about a time when she had prayed extemporaneously during uh, a time in the church tradition that she had grown up in, in the church community in which she'd been raised. She said not everyone was praying, though. I think people were self-conscious to be doing so, to be honest with you. I really do think that they feel self-conscious. What will people think of me? I never really worried about that. And yet, When talking about the experience of prayer in her current United Church congregation, she was reflecting on times when her minister invites parishioners to help shape prayers of the people. Iris said, I must remember to speak up. I've always held back because I knew. And I want people to get to know me maybe before I take up their space or something. There's always consideration of other people or what other people might think. Now notice that shift from, I never really worried about it in the church in which she was raised, to, there's always consideration of what other people think within her new faith community. That shift points to something, to a different sense of belonging in each of those communities. It suggests that we need to feel like we are really inside the circle of the community before we feel comfortable enough to pray. Something similar surfaced in Gwen's story as well. Gwen described herself as quick to speak up in a group when a prayer is requested, but said she felt great anxiety when asked to close her candidacy interview with a prayer. She worried about what her prayer would sound like in this group of strangers. Our perceptions and concerns around what other people will think of our spoken prayer may very well be, not surprisingly, closely linked to our feeling of connectedness with those around us. A fear of losing emotional control was also identified. Loretta described it as a big problem for her when she was starting out in ministry. For a long time, That was one of the problems I had with extemporaneous prayer because when I'd start, I'd want to cry because it was very emotional for me. Because it just seemed so amazing that I could have this relationship. In the early days when I started praying with people, that was a real hard problem. Iris shared what would happen if she opened up to pray extemporaneously. I think, she said, it would be more emotional. Emotions would come out, and I don't think I could control that. Even with all my years of experience, I think I would be emotional to the point of crying. Gwen and Iris both shared stories of encounters with people speaking in tongues. Gwen's experience happened in her teen years. She had been visiting a church with one of her friends, and she said she ended up running out of the church in fear and running home. The strangeness of losing control to that extent was profoundly unsettling to her, as it is for a great many people in mainline churches. Hugo's theory about United Church people's reluctance to pray from the heart during worship was this. There's something deeply Canadian about us. We freak out about that. That's like touchy-feeling, whoa, I'm not on with that. 
There's something profoundly mono-emotional sometimes about United Church worship. Why, where people don't want to get too excited and they don't want to get too upset. And why is that? Why is it important for it not to get too close to my heart? Part of the United Church, Hugo thinks, might be to say that for us, because of the traditions we come out of, our worship can be all cerebral. And I think there's a lot of truth in what Hugo is tapping into there. And if we're approaching our worship solely with our minds, that's bound to come out in our prayer life. Who hasn't run into this one? The expectations and traditions around the role of minister play into the dynamics of extemporaneous prayer. People perceive that the minister is the one who's trained for this, who's supposed to pray. It's not necessarily a case of seeing it as the minister's job, although that emerged as well, but there's also, as someone mentioned, there's a, there's a tendency in our society to defer to the expert in the room, as if perhaps other amateur voices, they don't count. As Regina put it, I think we have expectations of the person standing in the pulpit, expectations that they have a real call, and part of their call is to lead us in prayer. Loretta found that she was always the one called on to pray, saying, as the paid clergy person, you were the prayer. <laughs> it was lovely and refreshing when a lay person felt comfortable to offer prayer, and I loved that, she said, adding that I used to find that most people probably thought that you were the one who was prepared and wouldn't mind being put on the spot. Alexandra said simply, I take it for granted that clergy can do it. I take it for granted that they've prepared. Hugo expressed a lot of frustration around this expectation that it's up to the minister to lead prayer. If you come to church meetings because you have the letter and the holy hands, are like, Rev. Ann, will you lead us in prayer? And you're like, well, I didn't go to school and get ordained to lead prayer groups every day. There's an empowerment, he says, that the church needs to do. I could have part of that prayer, but why would you leave it up to one person in a group? Not everyone has to say something, but why leave it up to one person? Why is that so strange that having a prayer group is something optional for a church? It's crazy, says Hugo. You would be able to have a group of people who are praying for others and that want to take that up as a ministry. And there is an empowerment that the church has to do. Because whether it comes out of our cultural tendency to defer to the expert or as a remnant of a past tradition, people do expect the minister to do the praying. So we have to have the conversation in our tradition of the United Church, in my tradition, to remind people that the United Church upholds the ministry of all believers. And our communal prayer life is enriched by many voices. Amid our society's religious and theological pluralism, the waters around prayer get very murky. Questions like, who or what are we praying to? And what exactly are we praying for? Can be real barriers to people's ability to pray in extemporaneous form. Four of the participants talked about how their theology has changed over the years, and that has impacted their prayer life. One in particular lifts up for me, and Loretta shared a very poignant struggle. I've moved from having had, for all my life, a very personal relationship with God as I understood God. And now I don't understand God anymore as a being. And it's become so post-theistic, and I don't know how to pray in that situation at this time. So I don't have as rich a prayer life as I used to. I hope I will again. I don't know if I will again. So where do we go from here? Where do we take all of these themes? And why is extemporaneous prayer even important to us to consider? Well, it's profoundly subversive and countercultural. It stands in total opposition to our individualistic, self-sufficient culture Extemporaneous public prayer requires us 
to be in relationship together. It's a communal act. And it rubs up against our societal pressure to be calm, cool, and in control. We never know where extemporaneous prayer will lead us. It has the potential to throw us right into the mess of life and be emotionally messy together. Our vulnerabilities are often exposed, sure, but in ways that bind us together as we are able to respond to one another's need. And it also reminds us very profoundly that we are not alone. The relational power of extemporaneous public prayer was evident in the experiences of five of the six participants in this study. They affirmed that it deepened their connection with other people and with their community. <coughs> Gwen said, the more I'm connected to the spirit, the easier I find it talking to people the easier I find being there for people. Loretta spoke eloquently of how praying together can loosen people up to share more deeply. Sometimes, she said, it was after the prayer that we had the most intense visits. Something opens up. Or you've gotten past that time of trying to be careful that allows you to be more free, I think. I've always felt closer to people that I've prayed with than if I hadn't. It deepened my sense of relationship, of spiritual connection. Acknowledging that third presence made the whole relationship richer. Curiously to me, participants were mixed as to whether extemporaneous public prayer specifically deepened their relationship with God. Regina and Hugo felt that it didn't really matter if public prayer was extemporaneous or prepared. What matters, Regina said, is whether you really feel a deep sense of connection with God when you're doing it, or whether you're doing it just because. But Hugo also lifted up a freedom in extemporaneous prayer that doesn't exist with prepared prayer. What I love, he said, about extemporaneous prayer is that the gloves are off. And there's no mask about the piety needing to sound good, it's just God with me, and we're conversing back and forth. Gwen named that extemporaneous prayer has connected her with something greater than herself by making her think before she speaks, making her uh, tap into the words of her heart before she speaks. Iris spoke of experiences with women praying extemporaneously in healing circles. I found that very interesting, very healing, very warming to know that women would connect with the force that created them and want to be one with that. And through praying, consciously remove the clutter between their heart and the heart of God. Extemporaneous prayer opens a space where guards are let down, where people share from the depths of their heart and those moments resonate with people. That came through loud and clear in my interviews. So we need to find ways to empower people to feel comfortable praying aloud together. Prayer writing workshops help, I suppose, but there's something else. There's something beyond and besides learning the how-to of prayer. There's work to be done around fostering a sense of trust in our communities, because people need to trust that they will not be judged harshly if they say something strange or surprising or if they break down in tears or shouts of joy. Many of those experiences and many of the extemporaneous prayer experiences in, in groups uh, that were named in my, by my participants were actually in context other than Sunday morning worship. They were at camp, youth forum, green belt, a sweat lodge, places like that. And something different happens in those settings. Gwen captured the essence of that something very beautifully. She said, do you know what I mean by energy? That feeling where your skin's tingling and you're caught up in the spirit? I don't get that a lot at church, but when I do, it's amazing. 
but I get it in camp. Singing with this group, it's like the room is charged with an electrical current, and it makes you feel more able to pray. But Hugo reminds us that camp is a place where there aren't the same barriers. It's a different culture. It allows for all kinds of things to happen that won't happen on a Sunday morning. And that's okay. Context matters greatly. But maybe instead of always setting those two things in opposition to each other as that happens there and this happens here, maybe it's worth looking at those experiences and asking, so what was it about that prayer experience in camp that evoked such a powerful response that opened people up to pour out the prayers of their heart? What part of that can be tried on a Sunday morning? Are there ways that we can, uh, learnings that we can take from those camp experience that, experiences that will help us break down the barriers between people in our congregations so that they are more open to one another, more willing to be vulnerable together? Alexandra expresses a frustration with the physical distance at which people place themselves on a Sunday morning. It's hard, she says, to feel a closeness with being so scattered. In fact, that's probably a number one thing that we have to get over, this business of sitting way over in the back or way off to the sides. Iris doesn't think that we need to be taught how to pray. She believes that it's a matter of bringing people back to what comes naturally. She said talking to God is a natural thing. And bringing focus onto this natural, innate practice will give permission to more people to partake and not feel self-conscious. So it's a matter of having those conversations, of talking to people about prayer, of helping them to think about the times that they have experienced moments of prayer with one another and how did that feel and how did that enrich their, their lives. Regina believes that a lot of people want something, but they don't know how to go about approaching it. So that is our job, to find ways to help people approach extemporaneous prayer, to feel comfortable in communities. Hugo offered some great thoughts on how a culture of extemporaneous prayer might be developed. He said, I think you have to be intentional as a leader so maybe that means not so much putting people on the spot, but thinking as I go into a group or meeting, do I know people who are more comfortable in their faith, in having that kind of vulnerability, and going to that person and saying, I'm going to pray tonight or this morning, will you pray with me? So that it gets done, so that people witness it and say, okay, I can do this. So you need people in leadership who are intentional, intentional about making it happen, opening that space, and when it does, you celebrate. You've got to make sure that space stays open so that the prayer can continue to be heard and for that activity to continue to happen. Extemporaneous public prayer holds a power to bind people together into deeper relationships. It might take a slow boat to China approach to change a congregation into a culture where that kind of prayer is uh, free-flowing, where people feel free and safe to share the prayers of their heart. But isn't it worth it? Sharing the prayers of our hearts together in community is one of the prime ways in which we can participate deeply in each other's lives. And that brings us closer to the kind of interpenetrating relationship that God calls us into. And that, to me, is worth taking a slow boat to China. Amen. Amen. some friends and family here today, I believe, from uh, places such as Fall River, Enfield, Sackville, and Truro. Are you in this mm -hmm. area? So we welcome you to take part in our discussion now as well. Welcome. Uh, who'd like to commence? 
Ricky? <laughs> um, I really appreciated when you mentioned about, uh, at least in the United Church, a lot of our worship services become very cerebral. Uh, I really appreciated the language around that. And later on, when you mentioned how we, we, uh, we stop ourselves from being vulnerable with one another. And I think that those two go hand in hand. So how do we uh, move away from the structure that is creating this, uh, this worship service that maybe forces us to not become emotionally involved? How do we move to a place where we can uh, attach ourselves to that worship space, whether it's in regular worship or in co uh, committee or community, so that we can feel uh, free to engage the spirit that is already moving? Um, I think a lot of that, there's got to be a lot of work, I think, outside of Sunday worship to build some of that trust. Um, so to bring uh, more prayer into, into meetings and into the rest of our uh, lives together as, as congregational, uh, the rest of our congregational life. Um, because I think that, that the sense of closeness that will be exponentially, I think, um, grown in, in times of extemporaneous prayer, but you need to start with building that closeness in the first place. So there, I think small group workshops, uh, talking about prayer, preaching about prayer, um, and how prayer um, is such an integral part of our relationships, and it's, uh, it's one of our connections with God. And so to open that channel to bring the divine into, into our relationship, um, though, though, those kinds of educations um, need to happen, I think. And then it will, I think it'll be very, very slow process to bring that into worship. And it's not always appropriate in worship because there are times when you do want, um, you know, eloquent prayers and you want um, some of those beautiful uh, psalm language to be brought into, um, into the prayers, uh, the corporate prayers of the community. So you need a balance. Um, I think, you know, I don't think we would want to just go, uh, as, as Hugo is fond of saying, we don't want to go just go willy-nilly and throw away all of our traditions. So it's a matter of, I think, assuring people that um, we're, not, um, we're not totally trying to get rid of any old traditions. We're trying to reshape them in ways that uh, maybe can speak to us more contextually today. Thanks. Great job. Thank you. I was wondering, it sort of leads into what Ricky asked and maybe what you've kind of answered now. Did any of your participants speak to the specific ways, the ones, the ministers who were frustrated by um, always being the one asked to pray, did they have any intentional ways that they were working with their community to make it a safe space for them to feel like they could offer extemporaneous prayer? No, um, other than uh, Hugo's um, suggestions around uh, sort of planting people who are comfortable praying. Um, that was probably the prime way that, uh, that he had come up with in order to foster um, freedom in prayer was to lead by example and to have people that, uh, that already are comfortable to do that um, so that people can witness that and can say, as, as he mentioned, can say, I can do that. If so-and-so can do that, I can do that. And they, they look at... Um, people exploring extemporaneous pair and feeling comfortable to do it, and then the, you can see the experience of the community in times when somebody else from somebody in the congregation shares some prayers of the heart. There is almost always this um, beautiful, uh, attentive silence around that, and, and there's a resonance with people when people open up to that. So if we can bring more of that in, and people can feel that and witness it and say, oh, I, here's how I responded when somebody else opened up. So um, that, will try to, that, will, that will hopefully break some of the barriers down around what will people think of me, because we can reset our minds to say, well, I think that it's beautiful and I resonate with it. So, you know, why would I expect my community to think otherwise if I'm the one sharing the prayer? Thank you. I have, I have a few things that I'd like to bring up. I find this really interesting. Thank you so much for your presentation because um, extemporaneous prayer is something I sometimes have struggled with throughout the years and something that I'm still working on. And a lot of people around me have struggled. So. One thing that comes up sometimes is, um, and I think you're right about the education and learning about prayer, because mm -hmm. some people don't always want to pray for themselves or for situations. They're like, oh, only if someone's sick or only if someone needs help. That, 
And I, and I was also wondering if you ran into any situations while still wanting to keep the door open, wanting to people to feel comfortable praying. Um, were there any, was there any discussion around caution around prayer? So what you say, just to make sure it's not um, maybe hurtful or make sure it's appropriate or, because there is some kind of, um, th there's an importance to prayer. And, and so I'll, I'll give two examples. Uh, one example would be, someone who prays for healing for someone and what if that person you know isn't healed and that could be uh, difficult for their spiritual life and as well another situation I was in uh, a prayer station for example and it was about giving thanks and so it was a prayer of, a prayer of thanks mm -hmm. and not many questions were asked so they were kind of going off the top of their head still with love, but at the same time, maybe we should have went into deeper about what, what those people were talking about. So just, just, did you have any discussion around caution about praying when opening it up for everyone? So caution around what we're saying about other people or just yeah, what, what we're saying? We're saying. With other people, what um, we're that, saying. That, did, that did come up um, with, uh, I'd say, three of the, three of the interviews um, talked about how uh, there's, a, there's a caution around extemporaneous prayer because we don't want to break confidence. We don't want to share um, things that are not ours to share. And so educating the congregation and finding um, ways to appropriately lift up uh, community members without um, getting into the details of their, of their business, so to speak, um, crossing over into that gossip realm, as Rachel talked about. But um, there are ways, and as a, as a community is, becomes closer as well, you sort of have a sense of what is going on. So um, you know that uh, everybody knows that Bob is going in for surgery tomorrow, so you can lift that up in the community um, in a prayer. If you're praying extemporaneously and you're just wondering, who will I pray for and how will we pray for them? You can lift up those kinds of moments, but it's not, you have to be careful about, um, about bringing individual circumstances into the prayer, so you might want to frame it um, more in kind of a praying for um, the health of all the body, all members of our body or praying for um, somebody who is who is um, going through a difficult time in our midst and so not identifying things that that people would be uncomfortable identifying and that, so that did come up yeah uh, and first a question for clarification <laughs> um, with most of what you heard relevant to the idea of intercessory or petitionary prayer or were there conversations as well about prayers of praise, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers that included other kinds of expression? Or was the focus mostly on praying for something? It was actually mostly on praying for something, but that's where some of the struggle came in with people's changing theology, was that they uh, were no longer comfortable praying for someone's healing, for example, mm -hmm. or praying for someone's um, child to get better tomorrow, those kinds of um, interventional sounding or feeling prayers to them didn't work anymore. So. Did, did the people whose sense of their, whose sense of God then mm -hmm. was evolving to a point where they had some difficulty with petition speak of prayer as, as other forms of expression? How did they adapt? Um, well, uh, Loretta actually hasn't adapted yet. She's still mm -hmm. actually struggling her way through that and, and hasn't found a way to pray in the midst of her changing theology. Um, one of my other participants um, spoke about how she used to do a lot of uh, intercessory prayers and praying to God for particular circumstances and, and for uh, surgery to go well, for example, but now she is praying um, for healing energy to, to surround them or for uh, you know, God's comfort and for the, for, the, for the spirit to move through the community and to carry that person in, that, in comfort. And so for energy and spirit, more so than, uh, than asking God to, to, uh, to work a miracle. Your sense of what your respondents were speaking of was a concept of prayer strictly as addressed to God, or did they begin to broaden it as, a, a, as something more having to do with an expression of spirit? Um, there was a mix in that. I would say most of them are, uh, are in a place of praying to God, but but, but God's spirit moving through community, so not God as a being necessarily, but, but God, praying to God as, as, a, as an energy, as the creative force, as um, um, that spirit that moves through us. 
I think Lawrence just asked my question, <laughs> but I'll elaborate on that, or ask you to elaborate on it. Um, did people talk about prayer in terms of like the work um, of the Holy Spirit? Um, I know sometimes when I'm nervous about praying, I ask the Spirit to be with me and guide me. Um, and if so, what were the types of words or how did they describe um, how that would happen? Um, that prayer might be an extension of the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, there were a couple of different ways that that came out. Um, for the, uh, the participant who was an active clergy, talked about um, his whole business of writing liturgy, um, being part of his relationship with God and being prayer, in that the Spirit is present and working in that. Um, however, one of the other participants uh, had a real discomfort around the notion of the Spirit working in the midst of anything um, and would just simply want to talk about, about spirit as energy um, surrounding us, but, but uncomfortable with any idea of it working within us. And uh, I have a great cartoon of a pastor who says in a thought bubble, oh no, here comes Bob, I told him I'd pray for him. <laughs> And the second panel is another thought bobble, and it says, Dear God, help Bob, amen. <laughs> and then the third panel, he says, Hey, Bob, great to see you. I've been praying for you. A <laughs> um, little too true, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering about uh, the way in which extemporaneous prayer mm -hmm. is also an act of pastoral care. Um, and the metaphor, of course, is, is the, uh, the four men who carry their sick friend to see Jesus and bust through the roof. Because sometimes we can't get ourselves to Christ, so who will carry mm -hmm. us there? And there is a way in which, um, I think extemporaneous prayer is that self-giving offering to say, I will carry you and mm -hmm. your burdens, so you need not do that alone. I don't know if that came up, but that may be part of the hesitation and the vulnerability around, am I fit to do that carrying? Am I fit? Mm -hmm. Am I suitable to offer that kind of care to another? Or is that a professionalized activity? Mm -hmm. Maybe just a way to draw your trajectory out a little bit. Yes, I, uh, I would say that, that probably there, there's probably the sense that that is a professional activity. Um, the, the pastoral aspect came out in a couple of interviews um, where people found that profoundly empowering for them to be praying for and with somebody else. Um, although one of, the, one of my participants, I'm just thinking, she made a distinction between praying with and praying for and found it was very difficult for her to pray with someone, but she could pray for them because you go off and do that on your own. Um, so, but there is a sense, there is a sense in the, in, in a couple of the lay members of, of when they do visits, pastoral visits, that it's not their place to do, um, to pray with people. So they talked about, um, going on pastoral visits, but then saying, you know, if the person wanted, uh, prayers and wanted a minister that they could arrange that. So there, there is very much a, a feeling of, of, of prayer as being set off as being the role of minister again in that aspect, yeah. Is our time up for questions? No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to know if you found in your research any connection between um, attitudes toward extemporaneous prayer and attitudes toward other aspects of faith sharing, like testimonials or witnessing or evangelism. Yes, actually, um, in the United Church, and that, that came out as, as a great fear, um, a fear of a, a very impassioned and free-flowing prayer and expressions of faith, um, the testimony, the speaking in tongues. I mentioned that Gwen uh, ran home um, in, in terror, um, but there is a sense of not wanting to be that, not wanting to be that um, charismatic and that free-flowing, so that brings, that brings that tightness around the prayer that, uh, that we want to be very contained and prepared with our prayers lest we veer off into testimony. Yeah. 
Following along that, Anne, I'm just wondering if you found anywhere in your research if there was some difference. Um, you've often heard me say it depends on which string of the United Church you come from, mm -hmm. uh, what you, how you respond. Did you find anywhere in that uh, differences, say, from those who grew up in a predominantly um, church that was predominantly uh, Presbyterian versus uh, a church that was predominantly Methodist in its background or Congregationalist? Is there any, in terms of their approach to or their acceptance of or ability to enter into extemporaneous prayer? Uh, well, that actually specifically came up in one interview uh, of one of the candidates who came out of a Methodist tradition, and, uh, and, and, and he very much named that he found, um, he, he found that the, uh, the congregations that had a Presbyterian root um, were, were much more reserved, um, and the congregations that he was familiar with of a Methodist tradition had a lot of extemporaneous prayer, and the minister would ask somebody to get up and pray in the middle of a service. Um, so there was that connection, certainly, in one of, in one of the interviews. Um, I, I, don't, I, I saw a film recently that just struck home with what your project was. It was um, called um, August Osage County. And um, it was about a family, and to say that they were dysfunctional is uh, the understatement. I don't know if anybody's seen this. But there was this one scene in this movie. Um, the father uh, died, um, took his own life, and they had a funeral, and the family gathered around the table, and uh, Meryl Streep, who was the widow, says, well, I reckon somebody better say grace. <laughs> this took place in Oklahoma. And um, so they, you know, went around the table and everybody said, no, I, I looked you know, down at their plate or whatever. And finally got somebody to um, say grace. And um, he, st he, he just rambled, he, he stammered and stuttered. And, well, we thank you for uh, Uncle Sam. And, you know, uh, uh, he had his faults. Uh, and he started to name the faults. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, we, um, we, we remember him. He was still a good man, um, um, even though he, uh, you know, did this or, or, and did that. And it just, got, just went on and on. And, you know, Meryl Streep raises one eye, and she starts to give him the evil eye, you know. And he got wound up, and he didn't know what to say, and he just kept going and going and going and going. And so, um, and the theology got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> But um, I, he finally closed the prayer, and I, I thought it was a lighthearted moment, but it, in some way, even as bad as that extemporaneous prayer was, mm -hmm. it did something for this family. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, um, it, it, it gave them a sense of closure and redemption for the life of the one that they lost. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess uh, my question is, um, you know, if, can, how, how, do we, can, how do we help people um, who, who inside and outside the church don't have a sense or understanding of what prayer is um, and um, how, how that, that in our conversation with God, we just, we're just expressing our deepest and um, most profound questions and doubts and faults and so forth. Um, well, I think one step actually came out in, in one of my interviews where a participant talked about how in the secular world, actually, people pray all the time. And she named uh, uh, an experience in a bus stop where you'll have somebody saying, uh, such and such a thing happened, oh, dear God, let blah, blah, blah. Um, so having conversations and, and um, reminding people of the times that prayer happens, that it's not framed in prayer language. So, um, for example, when, uh, when the Newtown shoot shootings happened, my Facebook was flooded with all of these um, prayers, I would name them, but the people giving, offering them wouldn't have named them as prayers. They talked about, uh, um, you know, holding the people in their hearts, of sending power hums, of of sending uh, of healing energy and, and love and care and compassion. And some of those people were actually would have named themselves um, as profoundly anti-religious. 
Um, so that happens, and having uh, conversations around how we need to uh, tap, how, how people do tap into that uh, divine energy, even unconsciously, um, that comes out in our society. And, and talking about that and drawing attention to that, um, I think we'll, we'll just grow that culture. Thank you, Anne. Please join me in thanking Anne for her presentation. <laughs>